Welcome to Super Nutrition Academy's health class with your host and registered holistic nutritionist, Uriel Kame. Tune in each week for up-to-date insights on breaking health news and best practices on how to eat for awesome health. It's time to get smarter, healthier, and regain your sanity in a world of information overload. And don't forget to join Yuri at supernutritionacademy.com so you too can master your nutrition and health. Hey guys, Daryl came here. Welcome to another episode of the Super Nutrition Academy Health Class. I've got a real treat for you guys today, no pun intended, because in today's interview, I'm going to be interviewing uh, two good friends, Jason and Mira Carlton. They have, uh, well, Mira actually has a, a pretty amazing story that she's going to share with you about how uh, she overcame a, a pretty crazy diagnosis and how she later met her now husband, Jason, uh, which is pretty cool. But nonetheless, they've got some, uh, what I love about about this couple is that, th- I'll tell you about their, their uh, accolades in a second and why you should listen to them, but they also put out some of the most usable nutrition stuff that I've ever seen. Uh, They've got an amazing uh, book called Rich Food, Poor Food, which I think is one of the, again, just a staple that we should all have in our library. And they've uh, just come out with a new book called Naked Calories, which we'll be discussing in this episode, in this interview, which is just another tremendous book that I think anybody, as long as you eat food, should have um, at your fingertips. So let me give you a bit of background to who Jason and Mira Calton are, so you have a better idea of who we're talking with in just a couple moments. So uh, Jason has a lot of letters behind his name. We'll put it that way. He's <laughs> he has a PhD in um, uh, he has a PhD in a number of other things. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Association of Integrative Medicine, a diplomat of the College of Clinical Nutrition, and is a board certified micronutrient specialist. He's also board certified, board certified sorry, in integrative health, alternative medicine, and sports nutrition, and is one of only seven registered orthomolecular health practitioners in the United States. He's been working with clients all over the world for the past 20 years and specializes in teaching his unique nutritional and lifestyle therapies to adults and children with obesity, diabetes, high triglycerides, high cholesterol, ADHD, seizures, and more and more awesome diseases that need to be prevented and healed. So I could go on and on about (laughs) Dr. Jason Calton, but we'll stop it there. We'll shift focus to his wife, Mira, who is a licensed certified nutritionist, a fellow of the American Association of Integrative Medicine, a diplomat of the College of Clinical Nutrition, a board certified micronutrient specialist, and on and on and on it goes. So these are two great people who aside from their extensive educational and experiential background, have done a great job at taking a lot of the complexity, and this is why I want to introduce them to you guys, have taken a lot of the complexity in the world of nutrition and health and made it very simple for you to understand. So in this episode, in this interview, we're going to be discussing their latest book called Naked Calories, which by the way, I really believe um, you should pick up a copy of. It's awesome. I've gone through it. It's a really, really, really usable book. Uh, you can get it at pretty much any bookstore, Amazon.com, Barnes and Nobles, the whole bit. And uh, without any further ado, let's get to the interview. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of the Super Nutrition Academy Health Class. Yuri here, and with me on the line, I've got Jason and Mira Carlton. Welcome, guys. Oh, thanks for having thanks us. Thanks for having Yuri. us. Awesome. Well, I'm really excited to have you guys on the line with me because I'm really a big fan of the work you guys are doing because I think what separates you from a lot of the other nutrition stuff out there is you guys give people real actionable tools and resources to make this complex world of grocery shopping and understanding nutrition very, very simple. And I think um, it's just, it's awesome. I mean, your whole GPS, your grocery purchasing system from the Rich Food Poor Food Book is awesome. Um, You guys have kind of an updated uh, good foods to get organically, other foods not to get so good uh, in in their organic state. So you guys just come up with some really cool tools that uh, can really benefit a lot of people. 
Yeah, it's, thank you so much. It's it's overwhelming people so much. All this stuff that they're hearing about nutrition, they don't know what who to listen to or what's right. And a lot of times, you know, not everyone has a, a lot of time to sit down and do a, an in-depth scientific study. So we try to give them like brief snippets of things that they can take today to the grocery store or things that they can do in their life at home where their micronutrients or vitamins and minerals are concerned that will cha- make big changes in their lives with just these small snippets that we're feeding them. Yeah, that's awesome. So you guys have a, a new book coming out called Naked Calories, which um, I've, I've had a look through. It's awesome, and let's let's talk about let's talk about this in this podcast because I want to devote some time to this because I think this is again this is another book that uh, everyone should have. I, I really do believe. Um, so let's start off by talking about uh, your story. I mean, how did you guys before we get into the book? How did you guys start? I mean, how did you guys start working together? How did you guys come down this path of of doing the stuff that you're doing now? Well, um, when I was 30 years old, I lived in New York. I was a publicist and my back just started aching. And I thought, you know, I wear too many high heels and I'm working too many long hours and I'm going dancing all night. And, you know, I thought it was just my lifestyle and I ignored it and I ignored it for a long time. And then I literally, by the time I was 30, I, I wasn't able to do my job anymore. I couldn't go see my clients. I couldn't walk around during the day with them to go do events. And I decided I had to finally go to see my physician. I was forced to, you know, go and actually hear the truth. And what I found out when I went to see my doctor is that I, he diagnosed me with advanced osteoporosis. Hmm. He said, yeah, I had the bone density of an 80-year-old woman. And basically, he prescribed a whole bunch of medications, patted me on the back and said, now you better have someone take care of you for the rest of your life. Go live with your family, leave your job, and it's not going to get any better. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, it's just what you want to hear, right? Yeah. Um, and you know, I, I, of course sunk into a little bit of depression to be honest for a little while. And then I got to be me again. I said, okay, well, this is not who, this is not what I want. I do not want to be that girl who's laying in bed at 30. And I had to figure out a way to do this. And I'm not going to take the medications because I'm a research freak. And I started looking at the medications. I was like, these things are worse than the current situation I'm in. (laughs) So that wasn't an option for me either. So I started to, I did have to leave New York and sell my company I moved in with my sister for a while so she could take care of me, and I started doing research on micronutrients or the vitamins and minerals and essential fats that could possibly have caused this in my bones. And um, that mission to look for answers actually took me to meet Jason, who was my doctor, um, a PhD in nutrition at the time, already worked with clients on more with the weight loss and diabetes, but together we really started looking into these vitamins, minerals, and essential fats. And within only two years of working together and you know doing it through a, a good diet and supplementation and some physical activity, we completely reversed my osteoporosis, and that was just two years in. So it was pretty amazing, and that changed you know my the direction of my life completely. That's very cool. That's that's very cool. Just uh, kind of maybe I don't know if this is off topic or not, but what is um, maybe one or two little nuggets that you can share with people that. Uh, maybe a fallacy that your doctor or maybe some of the, the the nutrition people out there are talking about with respect to bone health that you kind of did something different to regain your bone mineral density. Yeah, well, I think there's a lot of misinformation when it comes at, when it comes to the osteoporosis. Uh, I think a lot of people think they can just go ahead and just eat foods that are high in calcium and magnesium, or just take supplementation that you know you, the more and more you take is better, but. It's, it's just not the case. I think the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle that we had to overcome was something, something that science calls micronutrient interactions or competitions. Mm-hmm. I started to first learn about these back in about nine, 1993. Um, I read an article in a, in a medical journal, and they were talking about some receptor site competitions for different minerals. And it really struck a chord with me because I was, I was you know, advising my clients at the time to take these multivitamins. And I started to think about, well, if these are, these are competing with each other, then maybe it's not the, the best format or the best delivery system to give them a multivitamin. Maybe it's better if I split them up. Um, and give them, you know, give them a few pills in the morning, before breakfast, after breakfast, you know, throughout the day. And what we dug into when we started to learn is that there's just not one or two, but there's about 45 different micronutrient competitions that take place in the typical multivitamin. Hmm. So that was the big thing we had to do with Mira was, you know, we really needed to, to, we mapped out all those known competitions. 
Um, and then we started to divide everything up. And for her, unfortunately, she had to take about 30 pills a day back in those days, about 10,000 pills a year, because we needed to get all those micronutrients in without the inherent competition. Since then, we've, you know, we've created our product nutrients, and, and that's really why we created it, so that we could come up with an easy way to get all those micronutrients in and not have to spend a fortune and, and take 10,000 pills a year. Yeah, I bet. No kidding. Well, that's, that's, that's good to know. I mean, um, I've spoken about mineral relationships and how important they are uh, in the past, but that's, that's, that's great to see like, you guys doing this in, in the flesh in real life because uh, that's really awesome. Um, okay, so let's let's get back to to naked calories for a sec. So you guys talk about your journey in the book a little bit, uh, which is really fascinating. Let's let's talk about what is a naked calorie. I mean, I think we we have the we have the idea that empty calories are found in most processed foods, where it's simply calories and no nutrition along with it. But what is a naked calorie? Yeah, so we wanted to do something different with, with, the, with the term. Like you said, we all know kind of the term empty calories. But naked calories are more than that. They're, they're, they're foods, any types of foods, even healthy foods, that have been in some way, shape, or form stripped of their micronutrients. So this could be through uh, just poor soil, uh, you know, soil depletion. It can be um, a food that maybe has, a, uh, has, you know, has pesticides on it. it maybe, uh, maybe it's because it's been cooked incorrectly or prepared incorrectly or maybe not incorrectly, but a lot of times we don't realize that when we cut things open and we expose it to air, heat, and light, we're losing micronutrients the longer we allow that exposure to happen. And so that's a way things could be turned into a a naked calorie. Mm -hmm. Um, Factory farmed meats like beef, chicken, fish, when we take... We take the animal and we give it unnatural feed in an unnatural environment. When we no longer, for example, let's say let cows eat grass, which is where they get the, the CLA and all those essential vitamins and minerals they need and outside in the sun where that sun's going to do the same thing it does in, in the human being, which is create vitamin D for that cow, for its flesh and for its milk, and we put it inside, then what we're doing is we're creating naked calories within that process as well. So, so we, this is a term that really just in, encompasses any food whatsoever that's had its micronutrients stripped in some way. Hmm. Yeah, it's pretty. Uh, and I guess I mean, I mean, you guys have traveled all around the world researching this stuff. Are there are there specific areas in the world that you've noticed that are worse than others in terms of soil depletion or farming practices or or other things that may lead to more naked calories? Um, the U.S. <laughs> yeah. Sad to say, but um, a better question would be who's doing it right. Yeah. And the answer to that is the more remote tribes we went to, it was either you know the mountains in Papua New Guinea or along the Sepik River, or in Papua New Guinea or along the Amazon. These were the people doing it right. Hmm. I mean, they planted seasonally depending on what was going on with their soil. If it was raining, they couldn't plant in the low ground; they had to plant up. So everything was constantly being churned, and the soil was staying really nice and replenish. They didn't overpopulate it and over farm it. So there are places doing it right. And, you know, that's why they're so healthy. They also don't have any of the processed bag box, bottled foods. They don't have anything coming shipped in from another place, taking, you know, 11 or 1800 miles before it gets to you, becoming further depleted. They don't go to restaurants and microwave their leftovers. You know, these are the, the places that are really doing it right. Unfortunately, here in the U.S., none of those things are true. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, from from your perspective, like, how do we how do we approach that that kind of native indigenous farming practice while being able to scale it for our population? Like, do you guys have any thoughts on that? Well, you know, when we're trying to teach people how to how to become micronutrient sufficient, you know, it's a big hurdle to jump because we, you know, everything that we're doing now with global distribution and the way we're farming and the way that we're doing things, and now with genetic modification of food, we're moving away from the right direction and, and, and at, a, at a lightning pace and in almost every way. But I think there's been some glimmers of hope recently with the local boar movement. You know, a lot of people now getting involved with their local farmers and buying food within that 100-mile radius. That's a great first step because, you know, one of the things that we, the most important things we saw and the first things we saw when we went to live with these tribes all around the world was that the food that we would be fed and the food they were eating was the food that they either caught in the river minutes ago or picked off the tree at that second, Mm -hmm. you know, so it's just, it's fresh and it's a different definition of fresh than what we have. You know, like Mira said, it wasn't shipped from another, you know, continent weeks, you know, shipped in the back of a container truck, you know, stored in your grocery store for two or three weeks. And then in your grocery, in your refrigerator for a few days, that's not fresh. It may look fresh, 
because of irradiation and other things, but it, it, it really isn't. So that's the first thing. Yeah, we started working with also with some new developing communities. And that's one thing we're really excited about, where we're actually teaching, and this is in Costa Rica, but um, where they're bringing in communities for, you know, Americans and other expats to move into, and they're actually building farms right on them. So we're really excited about that as a possible vision for what could happen. You know, we would love it if our neighborhood here would get rid of the, you know, the baseball field or whatever, the tennis courts, and put it in a small farm. Hmm. I don't see that happening in our neighborhood, but we are working with other communities. I know there's some here actually in Florida that we started working with uh, that we're talking to about building communities just like that. So I think it'll be kind of like the modern kibbutz, but a little (laughs) bit different. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, totally. It's it was actually um, a couple a couple months ago. I put up a little bit of a controversial statement on my Facebook page because I had this epiphany. I was like, I think more Americans know how to fire a firearm than they do grow their own food. And yeah. I don't know if that's not I don't know if that's true or not, but I just have the sense that it might be. And I think you know maybe getting back to basics and learning how to grow our own food could be a huge step in the right direction. Absolutely. Yeah, there's no doubt about it. I mean, reconnecting with food is such an important thing. Again, one of those things we saw in those cultures that we study was they had a real connection with it. It was their fish from their river. Mm-hmm. It was their fruits and vegetables from their land. They really had, I mean, they knew where it came from. They knew everything about it. They loved it. They it's- ate it. it. It nourished them. We we have a huge disconnect with our food. And I think that's a, another real big problem we have here in America. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think if, if more people knew what the whole food looked like or, or how it was grown. I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would guess a lot of people don't know what Brussels sprouts look like growing out of the, out of the soil. You know, <laughs> I would agree. You know, it's, it's not, it's not what you think it is, right? So I think if, you know, if we're able to connect at that level, it's so much more empowering. And I think uh, especially for kids, too, to learn that stuff from an early, from an early age is awesome. Yeah, we bring our two-year-old and three-year-old nieces to the farm that we go to that supplies our meat and our dairy. Mm-hmm. And um, not only do they love it, I mean, they love seeing all the animals running around, the chicken all at their feet and the meat, you know, petting a pig and all that stuff. But it also, I think, as they get older, we'll be able to introduce more of why we're there as they slowly age. And hopefully they'll become more aware than maybe, you know, our generation was. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Awesome. So with um, with Naked Calories, uh, assuming that most of us are, are eating a lot of Naked Calorie-based foods, what are the problems that can arise from this health-wise? Oh, my goodness. I mean, so many. So every micronutrient. So a lot of times people say, why in the world are you so focused on micronutrient deficiency? Are we really that deficient? Yes, we're really that deficient. Literally everybody is deficient in their essential micronutrients to some extent or another. According to the U.S., the FDA's own statistics, Mm -hmm. outside the U.S., it's the same thing. Europe, every single person... Uh, a, a recent study just came out. Every single person was at risk for a deficiency in micronutrients. So you say, well, what's wrong with it? We don't have scurvy anymore from vitamin C deficiency, or we don't see much rickets here in the U.S. anymore from vitamin D, although it's it's popping up again in Northern Europe. But what we don't understand is that every single deficiency of a micronutrient is connected to a health condition. So vitamin C deficiency can be connected to coronary heart disease or delayed uh, d- blood uh, clotting or cancer. Vitamin D, we know, is a big one for cancer and, and osteoporosis. Vitamin K, you know, again, osteoporosis and easy bruising. No matter what condition you have, it's connected to some kind of deficiency. So that's that's the big thing we want to get across to people is that, yeah, th- th- it's a... It's a, it's a, it's a, it's something that is affecting you. And if you have a, have a certain ailment that you want to get rid of, as long as you can learn what deficiency is causing it, all you have to do is reverse that deficiency. And nine times out of 10, those conditions will go away. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like plugging in the hole of a boat, you know, to kind of stop the water from seeping in. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And like, I think I, I, I love the fact that you guys are focusing on micronutrients because, I don't think a lot of people get this because, at least in the Western world, um, we don't have the issue of being undernourished. We, we're, we're kind of over, overnourished in the sense of, from a from a caloric perspective. But can, even though yep. we're getting more calories, we're getting fewer and fewer of these vital micronutrients, um, which is why I'm really excited that you guys are putting this information together because I think it's a really important message uh, for people to understand. We have a whole section of the thing about the two sides of a coin. Basically, the overfed, which is what you're saying, too many calories, and the undernourished is the same exact situation. They're in the same exact situation. Mm -hmm. In fact, in some studies, the micronutrient deficiencies were identical in both groups. Hmm. 
So it's just because they're getting a lot of calories, they're getting a lot of calories filled with naked calories, no, no, no actual nutrition. Yeah. And then it's, it's the same situation. So we're, you know, we, we totally believe in that and that they're both the same problem hmm. that needs to be fixed. So you say in the book that our food supply isn't the only problem, um, but other things like drinking coffee, taking medications, um, and even dieting can rob our bodies of these vital nutrients and cause health problems. How, how does that happen? Yeah. So we've got these things in the book called Everyday Micronutrient Depleters, or EMDs. And so our goal is to kind of show you all the places where these everyday micronutrient depleters can pop up. We mentioned some of the things of the food, like the cooking or the soil depletion or the heat, light, and air. But there's other things, like you mentioned, too, like lifestyle diseases, smoking, eating sugar, stress, even exercise. So we go on a diet. What do we do? We eat less. We exercise more. We don't think about the fact that the place where micronutrients come from are is that food. So as we reduce our calories from 2,000, let's say, to 1,500, we're also reducing the amount of essential micronutrients we're taking in. Then we're exercising, and those Gatorade commercials are there for a reason because those electrolytes that are pouring out with the sweat are also micronutrients. So then we're losing more that way. And so what we're doing is we're creating this deeper and deeper hole of micronutrient deficiency. And this is a really relevant point because deficiencies in Specific micronutrients, let's talk specifically about calcium and magnesium, are also linked to food cravings. So what do we all do? We go on a diet, we lose weight, every diet works, we all lose weight, and then one day something happens. We start stuffing our faces with some kind of a food that we know we shouldn't be eating, donuts, hot dogs, hamburgers, and we oftentimes gain that weight back. So the problem we have is not how to lose weight, it's how do we maintain that weight loss, how do we fight against those food cravings that we know that we all have but we don't know how to get rid of. And that Filling that micronutrient deficiency void can be the way that we can, we can get around that and we not have those food cravings and, and therefore not have to gain that weight back. Hmm. You also talk about stress being a, a contributor to robbing of these nutrients. How does, how does stress rob us of nutrients? Well, the water-soluble micronutrients like the B vitamins and vitamin C are excreted faster during periods of stress. So this is really important because vitamin C has been shown to be more effective by weight than held out, which is usually the medication given. Hmm. So if you just can stay sufficient, you won't have that stress. Additionally, B vitamins are known as the stress vitamins because the more you become depleted, even if you just take a small amount less in, in a day, you've been shown in studies to be cranky and irritable and get stressed easier. So staying sufficient in your B vitamins and your C will reduce the amount of stress you feel in the first place. And also taking them when you do feel stress will reduce the, the stress that you're feeling. Hmm. Very cool. So how does somebody listen to this? Um, I'm sure all of, everyone listening is probably like, well, I wonder what I'm deficient in. How does somebody find out if they are micronutrient deficient? Well, you know, that's, a, again, a great question. And, and if you're one of these, you know, you know, health geeks and you really want to know <laughs> exactly what micronutrient you're deficient in and to what extent, you can go and there's tests that you can take, blood work and hair analysis, where you can go and you can get that done. They're often very expensive. And... I don't actually think that's necessary. What we did is we created a quiz. Um, it's called the Micronutrient Sufficiency Profile Quiz. We have it for free online at our website, so anybody can go and take it. It's questions that we developed so that we know what you're eating, what your lifestyle is, how, what, kind of, what kind of supplements you're taking now. And by putting those 50 questions together, we can put you on what we call our sufficiency deficiency spectrum. It's not going to give you exacts, but it will show you where you're falling in that spectrum to let you know of, hey, I'm, you know, I'm pretty deficient or I'm real close to being in that optimal health zone. If you wanted to learn, again, which micronutrient, if you're real deficient, what we say is just go ahead and assume the deficiency, do everything that we talk about in Naked Calories. We give you three very exact steps to create sufficiency. Come back in a month or two. Get that sufficiency level up, and if you still want to know exactly what vitamins you're deficient in, then do the do the tests, those more um, specific tests. Then, at least that way, you know you can make some real changes, and you won't be wasting your money the first time around. Awesome. And what's the what's the URL for that online test? Uh, if you go to Colton C A L T O N Nutrition dot com, you can see it's right on the main page there. There's like a little question mark, and then you take your sufficiency quiz right there. Beautiful. All right. So everyone listening or, or reading the, the transcript of this of this interview, uh, be sure to take this. I mean, it's just it's just awesome insight into how your body is is working, which is always a good thing. 
Um, I just want to back up for a second. You mentioned that a lot of uh, food cravings can be attributed to calcium and magnesium issues. How does, how, I mean, you know, um, a lot of people are suffering from like adrenal fatigue and exhaustion and stuff like that, which can be related to why they have salt cravings so much. Is there, like, how does, how do, how do cravings for, for salt, for instance, or, or, or things like that tie in with uh, calcium depletion or how does that whole cycle work? So, yeah, we start, so we have this craving for salt and we call it the crave cycle. So we go in, we, we, we eat something that's salty and that salt then tricks the body and it leaches calcium out of your bone. And that brings the calcium into the bloodstream so that your body thinks, okay, well, we've got plenty of calcium here. But what we're really doing is that salt is leaching the calcium out of the bone into the bloodstream. We go through it. And then after a while, when that dissipates, we go back into a calcium deficiency and hence we, we, we start craving salty foods again. And that calcium deficiency in some people is linked to a sugar craving instead. You know, we always say there's two types of people out there, salty people and, and sugar sweet people. You ask them the question, what would you rather have, a piece of chocolate cake or a pizza? And people can usually answer pretty quickly. I'll take the cake, I'll take the pizza. So you're that pasta person or that candy cake person. What if you want both? <laughs> what, sometimes you're both, and that's you know they that's just probably have a calcium magnesium deficiency yeah. if, if the cravings are really really strong. Now, I mean, this is a perfect example of my of my osteoporosis. I mean, I literally was living a life where gummy things were my everything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I would literally every time, especially in New York City, they follow those candy stores. I would walk down the street and I would see Swedish Fish, and that was it. I had no control to stop, and now I, I was very very skinny because my bones were getting so small, but also I, I had to eat these things repetitively. And now I can look at that and say, wow, I wish someone had told me when I was getting sick that if you have a lot of sugar cravings, you need to watch your calcium magnesium levels and it's a good chance you might be deficient. I mean, that would have been a great clue to the fact that I was going to be getting osteoporosis. Huh. Yeah, no kidding. Okay. So assuming most of us have deficiencies, how do we go about and fix the problem and become micronutrient sufficient? So that's, this, that's why we wrote Naked Calories. That's the simple three-step plan. We want people to, first of all, we want them to what we call switch to rich. We want them to go ahead and go in, and buy the, that locally grown food, the organic foods when necessary. Um, use rich food, poor food. You know, you, we use the rich food, poor food. You know, the book Rich Food, Poor Food will show you how to find those rich foods in the grocery store. So we're food first people. We think that that's the best place to make the changes and really to dedicate the majority of your time there. The second step is to be aware of all those lifestyle habits we were talking about. Do you live in a, a big city where pollution is a factor? Or do you live with, or are you a smoker? Do you exercise a lot? Are you always dieting? We go over all those lifestyle factors. And do you drink a lot of coffee? And so you, not so much that you can change them. If you can change them, we want you to. But we want you to be aware of how many times you have to then add or, or subtract micronutrients from your total. You know, a lot of people go out there and they say, hey, you know, look at this diet. This diet is sufficient in micronutrients. So if I eat it, I should be sufficient in, in whatever micronutrients they're studying. But they forget the, the, the important thing. They forget, first of all, to look at things like oxalates and phytic acid and all these everyday micronutrient depleters that occur in food. But then they also forget to subtract the micronutrients that are lost in, the, in these lifestyle habits that we talk about. Mm -hmm. And once you do that, then you start to uh, you see oftentimes that we're very deficient. Now, the third step. Uh, is not for everybody. Some people don't want to supplement. Some people think, I want to do it all through food. And that's fine. You can, you can work to try to achieve that. That's going to be much, much harder. But for the vast majority of people, we highly recommend supplementation. To really take a good supplement, use it as a supplement, not as a substitute to a good diet, but it will really help you to fill in the voids between where your healthy diet leaves off and where micronutrient sufficiency is met. Hmm. So you talk about uh, looking for, for instance, like a product or a supplement that 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 has anti-competition technology. I don't know if I've personally seen any vitamins or minerals that I've that have been aware of that have that. Like, it's like, what is that? Is that the actual terminology on the product label itself, or how yeah. do? You, and and if not, how do people get around that? Like, is instead of taking a multi, are they looking at taking individual minerals and vitamins at different points throughout the day, like you had, Mira? 
Yeah, well, that's an option <laughs> to take them all separately. Mm-hmm. Um, anti-competition technologies, actually, we just got the patent on it this year, and we're actually very excited that a few other companies have since come to us and said, we want to look at this patent. Can you, can you know, can we license it out or whatever? Because it's so, it changes the game. I mean, it completely changes the absorbability of a, of a micronutrient. And what it is is, like, everyone's been in a room or a car with kids who are yelling at each other. And you can say, stop hitting each other. You know, if he's poking me, they won't share. But nothing works <laughs> until you actually take them and put them in two separate rooms and give them a break from each other. Yeah. And then everyone behaves. Well, it's the same thing with vitamins. You know, vitamin A and vitamin D in cod liver oil, we've all heard there's a competition there. And that's what makes it so that vitamin A isn't, it doesn't reach toxicity. So that's great in food. But when we're looking to take a multivitamin, the last thing we want is for one thing to negate the other. So what we've done is we've actually separated our, our multivitamin and anti-competition does this into just two packages, an AM and a PM that you can take that completely separate all the competitions. And competitions occur four different times all the way from manufacturing to utilization. So it really was a labor of love to try to figure this out. And um, we're thrilled that the U.S. government gave us a, a patent on it. That's awesome. Very cool. Yeah. So there we go. The uh, anti-competition technology. Look out for it, guys. It's going to be a game changer. That's wicked. All right. So what is the the best place for people to get the new book? Is it uh, online in the bookstore, from your website? Let us know. It's available everywhere. It's we were on, not I our think, website. Not our website. Um, <laughs> yeah, Barnes and Noble, like you said, um, Amazon.com. I think we're in like six thousand grocery stores across the country. So yeah, pick it up anywhere. Awesome. Awesome. So once again, everyone, that is Naked Calories by Amira and Jason, Jason Calton. Awesome, awesome book. Uh, again, this is something, as long as you eat food, you need to know this information. That's the way I see it. So you should definitely have this book in your hands. Um, anything you guys want to finish with before we uh, end today's interview? No, just thank you so much for having us on to, to, to talk to your to your tribe about everything that we believe in with micronutrients and um, just want to thank you, I guess. Yeah, and if anybody have any questions about micronutrients, they can always contact us at ColtonNutrition.com. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys, for uh, for taking the time and then sharing your wisdom and this, this new awesome addition to your lineup of awesome books. And for everyone else listening, do not forget to grab a copy of Naked Nutrition. Um, sorry, Naked Calories, not Naked Nutrition. Yes. Naked Calories is the <laughs> book. And uh, we'll talk to you guys in the next episode. Thanks so much. Bye. Bye.